Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. The Focke-Wulf FW200 Condor was quite literally a savage airliner. Originally designed to be Lufthansa's aircraft of choice on its European, transatlantic and South American routes, it became so much more than that. And that is going to be what we're going to be discussing on today's episode with friend of the show, Matt Willis. But before we get to that, we need to do the sponsor bit. And of course, along with our fantastic partners at the Pima Air and Space Museum, more about that later, we have the fabulous 909 Apparel as sponsors of today's episode. If you've seen me in the real world, you will know that I love a great aviation theme t-shirt and hoodie. Yet finding decent quality ones has been more of a difficult process than I would have hoped for. That is, of course, until I found the fab. 909 Apparel. Named after the famed B-17 Flying Fortress, which flew 140 missions without losing a crew member, 909 Apparel's designs celebrate the history and heritage of aviation, which is something I can totally get behind. Each design can take up to three months of research to complete, so that you know that your passion for aviation is matched by the team at 909. And the great thing is you can get your 909 Apparel t-shirt or hoodie just about wherever you are watching this, all through their Amazon shops. So do check out their link tree below to find your local store and get your aviation on. And yes, they do Spitfire ones as well. Check out the link in the description below. So we have to delve into what brought Matt to this, because he covers a lot of subjects. Naval aviation history is his thing, is his handle on Twitter. So where did this particular story start? So I suppose this is confession time that I tend to drag you on it on these things at the last minute when I, <laughs> I realize I, I need something. So thank, thank you for that. But let's, let's get cracking. Was this a commission or was this something that you'd wanted to delve into for a while? Cause I, we've, we've talked about this aircraft in the past, but wh where's, where's the idea for this, this book come from? Oh uh, no, this came from Morton's. Um, this was, uh, they, they approached me to, um, to see if I wanted to, to do it basically and and this was my first contact with morton so obviously as as things happen i've had two books with them out prior to this um but that was more a case of once the conversation started uh i started talking to them about well actually i have these ideas for um fleet air arm books and are you interested in those and because i had a quite a lot more of that work underway they were able to to get out the door somewhat quicker um, but yeah, there was, this was what they originally approached me for because they were doing this series on, on Luftwaffe aircraft mm -hmm. and the only, I mean, I'd done the, with another author on to MMP books on the Junkers 87. Um, and again, that was not really my traditional area. And that was more that I was, that I'd done so much work on the text that I got, um, uh, you know, that, that, that I was kind of bumped up to co-author. So this is really, I consider this my first Luftwaffe book. It's, it's an, an aircraft that's, that's interested me in terms of the way it has impacted on the stuff that I've been writing about from the other side. So it's something that I probably always would have got to. Um, and when Morton's approached me about Luftwaffe aircraft, this was one of the ones on their list. And this was like the one that jumped out at me as, as the one that, that was natural for me to, to tackle. Yeah, so so that's kind of how it, how it went on in terms of the book i feel like i own it now it doesn't feel like something that i was hired to do it it does feel like like a project that was that was something that i was personally invested in um and that's probably why it took so long um in the way that that these things do with me it was it, it was longer than it was meant to be um you know I, t I took more time than i'd expected writing it just because there was a lot more there and the story was a lot more interesting in addition to the to the fact that it's a German aircraft, so a lot of the sources are in German language. A lot has been written about this aircraft in English, but I like to go beyond that. Yeah, so th that's the, the sort of the, the, the rambling story of it, really. Well, let's get into the, the detail then, because I, you know, my first knowledge that you were doing this is when you started sharing all of the, the plates for the, the different aircraft that are in, in the middle which are fantastic dear listener but how did kurt tank get into the airline business and fokker wolf for that matter because i suppose most people will think of tank immediately go fw190 
they don't really think of the the other aircraft that he produced while at at Fokker Wolfs. Mm, mm, and mm. this this is always interesting because in that very hagiography of his that was written in the fifties, all of this bits just like a few bits in the middle, isn't it? There's not there's not a lot on his his wartime aircraft. But mm. what 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 brought him into this? Was this like, for example, the the Heinkel Junkers Donia aircraft that were sort of backdoor bombers, or was this always going to be an airliner? Yeah, this was a this was kind of a ploughed its own furrow, really, in, in alongside all those aircraft that were half thought of or entirely thought of as as military aircraft. Focke Wolf had been involved in the airliner business before. Um, they'd been they'd made a few small and rather old fashioned. Uh, sort of regional local airliners, mm -hmm. single engine jobs that that really didn't show anything like the way to the 200. Focke Wolf found themselves sort of going into the mid 30s with kind of spare capacity because they'd lost the competition for the um, the fighter that became the Messerschmitt 109. They had been doing a lot of they had been providing things like the uh, the FW 44. Um, trainer and um, things like that, and, and the, they had a sort of a, a bit of you know mid-level business with the Luftwaffe up to that point. But but then when you get to the mid 30s, they lose the big one that they were going for, and suddenly there's a bit of spare capacity in the factory. And by this time as well, we're onto Luftwaffe rearmament and modernization, and everything's military aircraft. But then it's it quickly you quickly get into the point where from America you've you've suddenly got all these modern airliners coming out, uh, notably the Boeing two four seven and the Douglas DC two and then DC three, and suddenly you've got the uh, the German airline business which has been doing very well from things like the uh, the Junkers fifty two, you know very widespread aircraft, very successful aircraft that that's not that old in the scheme of things, but it's by sort of mid into late thirties, looking very, very dated, uh, and is starting to be quite badly in need of a replacement. Or the the German industry is going to lose all this business to to these interlopers from the states. And I suppose that's that's this interesting crux, isn't it? Because like we were saying, the the Donias and, and the the Jury Eights that we see coming later, nominally airliners that can carry. <laughs> Lots of mm. bombs, not many passengers, um, <laughs> or some bombs and some passengers. Th this one is is interesting because in the book you start looking at Deutsche Lufthansa and and their requirements as well. And we've talked about the the um, Boeing two four seven with Ben Skipper in, in in the past as well. That a very very advanced aircraft that's mm. probably slightly priced out by Douglas, which is ironic considering the backdoor takeover of. Boeing by Douglas many years later, mm. different podcast. But yeah. what what does I'm probably going to say Lufthansa a lot just because the abbreviation is DLH. I'm just going to start saying DHL, and I'm, that's going <laughs> to yeah it. yeah uh, Luft, so, Lufthansa. So, is... Yeah. So, so what what were Lufthansa after in this aircraft? Because they they did buy the American aircraft as well, didn't they? So it's it's kind yeah. of a BOAC thing where they they want to buy local but end up grabbing whatever's best out there to be able to compete yeah i mean they do get some 247s um and but really they they're well the again there's a lot of sort of mythology around this that it's difficult to kind of tease out sometimes particularly mm. when it's not in the native language the the popular story is that, that that they were looking for a transatlantic airliner in fact what they were mostly looking for was a Junkers 52 replacement Something that was that could do what the Junkers 52 did, but was more modern, was faster, was more comfortable, uh, could go a bit further, but not a huge amounts further, and was just more efficient and had all the sort of modern maintenance benefits and all that kind of thing. So, in any other situation, they'd have probably ended up buying DC3s and being happy about it. But um, Germany, prestige. A lot invested in the aircraft industry to to sell uh, the the benefits of advance under science under national socialism and all that kind of stuff uh, and um, it, it was not a good look for the German flagship carrier to be 
either falling behind in terms of its um, its aircraft or buying foreign. So there was this requirement for a, a modern airliner uh, that was essentially a replacement for the for the Junkers 52, but also I think there was a sense, certainly coming from Tank, that they could create something more ambitious that, that would be a bit more attention-grabbing and and could do some of these publicity worthy events that that were kind of happening. So you have the sort of the Muck Robertson race, uh, which you know the the DC two and the two four seven. Uh, the you know that that's a good way to sell them, where they're kind of beating these specialist racing aircraft in in a bog standard airliner. Um, so you know these there's this idea out there of these long distance kind of speed and endurance flights with modern airliners and i think certainly kurt tank wants to get into that game and the the lufthansa ma- management are certainly not averse to getting into that kind of thing themselves as well so there there's an idea that a german aircraft that can compete not just commercially but in terms of publicity and demonstration of the values of the the country that it's being developed in and all that kind of stuff which you get a little bit less of in britain there's a little, it, it's very much it's not so much there that, that the sort of the industry's commercial products are a a symbol of national prestige if you like there's a little bit less of that i think coming from britain but yeah so you have things like the junkers 86 the heinkel 111 the dornier 17 a little bit um and you know those are those are really developed with with a dual commercial and military purpose in mind, and that limits their potential as airliners because, as we'll come to later, when you're building a combat aircraft, particularly a sort of tactical one, I mean, the, the, the Germans are sort of in a little bit of a muddle at this point as to whether they're doing strategic or tactical bombing, but there's a, an idea of like these medium bombers, which is the category that they would fit into, are, are really sort of on the tactical side of things. And you need them to have certain strength factors uh, and to be certainly when, she, when you've got Ernst Dudet comes in and wants everything to be able to dive bomb, then everything has to be really, really strong. But there's a sense that a combat aircraft has to be stressed really quite somewhat higher than a purely civil aircraft and that limits these aircrafts modern as they are high performance as they are it really does limit their potential as as, as airliners and you know they're not that comfortable the cabins are cramped uh you know you have sort of things like step over spars to to get into the cabin and stuff like that and it, it's not they're not designed in that way they're kind of um, the idea is that they're kind of shoehorned into that role a little bit and, you know, using them as mail planes or, and um, airliners with, you know, for very small numbers of, of people, really. It's, it's uh, they're not ideal um, and they're not really the kind of thing that can, that can sell uh, Nazi Germany as, as this kind of advanced modern country in the way that a dedicated airliner can. So this is what Lufthansa is looking for uh, when it when it submits this requirement for for an airliner in the mid thirties, let's get on to the FW two hundred airways because it it comes together quite quickly once that requirement mm. comes out, doesn't it? So tanks not holding around, Fokker Wolf's not holding around because you, as you said, they they have this this need to be selling something. So let's for the the dear listener and viewer, let's 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 describe the thing because it is a pretty aircraft and. <laughs> It's got similar sort of lines to what de Havilland would do with the the Albatross a few years later, isn't it? It's it's that sort of very sleek, quite sort of I want to say pointy style of mm. airliner that everybody would quite recognise as as an airliner, wouldn't? It? Yeah, I mean it's it's one of the first really modern looking airliners I think that looks like an airliner in the way they still do today in many ways. It's got that sort of slender um, spindle shaped fuselage with the sort of you know to the sort of coming to the pointed nose uh, and it's got these sort of slender tapered wings which you know obviously aren't swept the way they are now but there was you know this was it must have looked really really unusual and elegant in a way that the airliners didn't at the time it, it really did have these these very high aspect ratio wings which are sort of associated with gliders and things like that which which aren't you know they sort of scream efficiency 
it gives good range it just you know it gives good lift and um no it's a sort of basic of aerodynamics that the higher aspect ratio a wing is the more efficient it is and it's it's just you know obviously there's a whole lot of complexity under underneath that and again a sort of a, a slender sort of fairly low frontal area fuselage just you know low drag it, it there's nothing there's no lumps and bumps sticking out of it as an airliner anyway obviously it'll get plenty of those as a, as a combat aircraft but it's just very clean um and very sort of well designed in that and it's in some ways it's less modern than the douglas dc2 dc3 because you know there are panels in the outer wing that are still fabric covered uh, and yes it is an all, mo- all metal structure but there's still parts of it which are sort of steel tube it's very much a semi-monocoque um, parts of it are stressed skin and as i say you've got you've got sort of fabric covered sections of the wing and things like that so it's it's not it's pretty state of the art but it's not it's not a step beyond uh you know obviously it's not pressurized either it's so it's uh, you know which was not 100 percent necessary for airlines at the time that sort of added a lot of weight and and complexity which uh, which was not something that that tank wanted to go into and it's four engine which obviously the american ones were, were two engine they though two engines of slightly higher power so you're looking at sort of what 1200 horsepower per per engine on the um douglas certainly um the the, the Condor comes in with engines of just under a thousand horsepower, uh, four engines of just under a thousand horsepower. Um, but then you, again, you've got this dependability of four engines, and you know it gives you more possibilities for crews and things like that. And it means you can, it just means it makes for a larger aircraft, which you can then either fill it with fuel or with passengers, and it gives you choices. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just um, it, it's following the american airliners a little bit they, they were the really groundbreaking ones but but this is when you compare it to things like the Junkers 52 which is is coming after in in terms of german aircraft and it's doing things differently it's not a carbon copy so you've got the the four engine layout uh, and um just a low wing layout and uh, and things like that and it's it's just um they pay a lot of attention to the cabin layout so you've got things like uh there's a there's the cabin is split into two so you've got a forward and aft section so you can have a smoking section and a, non- and a non-smoking which was something they built in from the start from quite early on that the aircraft had a they had a dedicated steward uh, and they were the this, this was the first airliner that was that was routinely operated with a with a dedicated steward um on every flight so so there's these sort of modern touches of the modern airline are really starting to to come in now and it was it was a it was a great deal more comfortable than the uh, than the yunkers you don't have it's a very comfortably appointed cabin you don't have this um uh you know you don't have the sort of structure showing through the way you do with the the tri-motors and things like that it, it, it's all um it, it's all very you know, well appointed and in booths almost where you've got across a table in the in the first class cabin where the passengers are facing each other rather than rather than in sort of bus like seats. Uh, so so it's um you know it does look it does look rather modern, um, but it's it, and it's a good compromise between uh between sort of flexibility and performance and capability. So you've got this you know, you can operate it as a luxury airliner. You can operate it as a long-range airliner. If you use one of the cabins for additional fuel tanks, then you can you can carry a small number of passengers, six passengers, say, a very long way. Or you can carry a sort of 22, 23 passengers, still a reasonably good distance. What, what sort of re- – what is a reasonable distance? How, how far? Because, you know, the, the sort of narrative is, is to keep Argentina and places like that in – in mm. contact due to due to the, the high the high densities of, of expats and things like that is is this designed for that sort of route or are we talking more european sort of thing i think initially it was certainly more european but it does have this because it's got the possibility to operate in a long range configuration you're talking about but just under 2000 miles um possibility whereas the the, the douglas i think tops out at around 1500 so we're not talking about drastically further, um, but a good step further. And there is, it does open up these possibilities for the for the South American run, um, and also things as you see later on. There's the the airline in in Manchukuo that wants to operate uh, a, a kind of linking airline from from Manchuria to Germany, or to Europe certainly, uh, which doesn't 
turn out in the end because of the the inconvenient war in the way. But um, but you know it, it it's opening up some of those global possibilities that 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 weren't really that available with anything other than flying boats, which were very inconvenient and tended to have these sort of very short legs. So you 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 know you take a week getting to some of these places because of all the the stops and layovers and refueling. Whereas with with something like the Condor, you could be shortening that to a couple of days. Um, so I think it was, I think it would have been interesting to see what it did open up had the war not got in the way, um, because I think it was um, there were some kind of global communications possibilities that that, that the aircraft offered, uh, which weren't really. But yeah, I mean, the main thing was Europe, and this was. Uh, after Lufthansa, and I dare say we'll get into this, but after Lufthansa did the the long distance publicity flights, all the route proving stuff really was around Europe and to places like Latvia, um, which was sort of very much on the the German radar within within that sort of orbit uh, of of what uh, kind of Hitler had his eye on as a sort of German sphere of influence. But yeah, I mean that that was so. I think really after they, you know, you hear a lot about the transatlantic stuff and the the Far East and things like that. And there there was that angle that was offered. Uh, and obviously, the first airline that that bought the fir- uh, the, the first non Lufthansa airline that that bought aircraft was was DDL from Denmark. So you know, it was. I think it would have been a a very prolific aircraft in in Europe as as well as doing some of those longer range things. So I, t- I take it Lufthansa were quite happy when they finally saw the aircraft and could see what it was doing yeah i mean everything i've seen suggests that that they were um yeah they were more than happy with it really that 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 it was other than the usual sort of kind of developmental stuff so you know you see the flying surfaces change slightly um the wings acquire the outer wings acquire that slight sweep back the tail the vertical tail is made made a bit bigger but other than that through that development which is really quite rapid um for, for an aircraft of this modernity they they seem to be quite happy with it and they've, they've ordered a number of them and they're ordering more um which again is, is partly how it gets into Luftwaffe service so quickly is is because Lufthansa have, have been ordering a second batch um or further batches of it to um to, to meet their needs and i think they probably would have operated it in quite large numbers um had the war come along a couple of couple of years later or not at all so um so yeah i mean as far as i can tell so obviously there was probably a sense in which they were going to have to order this aircraft politically but everything i've seen suggests that that, that actually it was the airplane they wanted let's let's put some dates on this which we haven't done mm. really yet have we so RLM issues the the spec in thirty six and it's flying by when is it late late thirty seven I want to say or is it uh, that sounds right yeah um, sorry excuse me dear I'm listener both of us have immediately grabbed the book because <laughs> we've spent more time preparing the KG four D stuff than we have <laughs> the Lufthansa things so yeah it, it's and, it's, it's a remarkably to, quick development isn't I have it? to tell you like dates and stuff like that fall out of my head as as soon as the, 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 as soon as the thing comes out in print all of the, the like the, the facts and figures just fall right out of my head, uh, but yes. So twenty seventh November. 37. Well, it's it's in yeah. Well, yeah. yes, late thirty seven. It's flying, um, and then it's doing its test flights sort of throughout thirty seven. The other development aircraft are appearing, um, and you know, into into thirty seven, thirty eight when it's doing the you know they're, they're they're really trying to sell it to to other airliners and uh, and doing these um these publicity flights so um, the, pu- the publicity flights are interesting because that's where yeah. it runs straight into good old-fashioned protectionism <laughs> yeah. especially in the united states isn't it so lufthansa take this thing in, and do the tours that we we still see with with new aircraft mm. today mm. that they they'll they'll do all the big air shows they'll fly around in launch customer colors you know the i think of uh, the 787 that's at pima in ana colors that very rarely flew for ana but it went everywhere in ana colors they do a similar sort of thing with this don't they and when they get to the states it also it's getting a bit tetchy yeah um which which i found surprising actually because this is like this is 1938 when they they want to do they want to, kurt tank again is is very keen on these sorts of flights because they're really selling 
fuck Wolves. Uh, and also possibly have being a little bit stung in missing out on some of the, the military contra- contracts. He's, he's really pushing this. Uh, so they want to do a circumnavigation is the, uh, is the story. And the, the first leg of this will be a transatlantic flight, which is, um, you know, it's got because there are no conventional airliners in straightforward transatlantic service uh, at this time. Uh, so it would be a big deal to get an, an airliner to, to be able to do this transatlantic flight. And um, the story is that the they they were refused the necessary permissions and overflight permissions to the la- the kind of landing rights and and overflight permissions to 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 carry out this 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 circumnavigation, and that they had to then. Uh, they then sort of use a little bit of subterfuge because they had certain they had, they had some licenses for sort of pro- route proving flights that were intended to be carried out by flying boats, but they slotted the the two hundred into one of these in order to allow it to to do the flight to Floyd Bennett Field uh, and set a sort of speed record across the Atlantic and uh, and things like that. So this surprises me slightly. Because obviously there's an awful lot of geopolitics going on at this time, uh, and um, you know we're we're into 1938, so um, Munich crisis territory, and um, I don't think anybody is under any illusions anymore about Hitler's territorial ambitions uh, and and sort of some of the stuff that's that's going on there. So that kind of there is a an element of that, but on the other hand, I think the, the there was still a certain amount of favorability to towards Hitler in uh, in America generally. He wasn't sort of the universal <laughs> po- bogeyman. Po- politic way of putting it, my dear Matt. <laughs> well, quite. <laughs> and I so say this also surprised me in particular because the year before that, the Soviet aircraft, the Tupolev ANT twenty five, had done its own had done the sort of transpolar flights and set the the distance record by landing in um, California. See and, another Matthew Willis article for, for more on that. <laughs> well, yeah, um, but it's it's like, and they'd they'd been welcomed, and the pilots had been sort of wined and dined at the White House and things like that. And this is the Soviet Union, which I think many in America, at the time as well as later on, really saw as their their natural enemies. So it's this kind of surprised me that by the, by a, just a year later, um, everything's very much more protectionist and and nationalistic almost in the, the way that they're treating this um this sense and maybe they just didn't want the competition to the to the douglas and the boeing you know but it is interesting and obviously i think there's there's a certain amount that you know what was a kind of cold war between the u.s and the ussr in in the the 30s there there was more of a sort of detente around that time and then obviously with just a year later with with hitler is a very very different kind of scenario but yeah that is interesting with the politics uh, and then there was the idea that afterwards they would go on and do this sort of Far East tour and things like that. Uh, and then the the prototype crashes, uh, it, it ditches and it has a landing. The engines um, lose power on takeoff and it ditches it in Manila. Uh, and this is kind of embarrassing. Um, but it doesn't really harm the aircraft's prospects. It's still got its, um, it, it's still got its, uh, it's export sales. Nobody who's actually placed orders cancels any. Possibly there's the Dutch airline that's looking at it that then doesn't buy any. The first prototype, it's actually it's not in bad shape after the ditching, but then it gets wrecked when they're recovering it. But by then you've got the sort of the additional prototypes and the, the, the early production aircraft are, are not far off. So, uh, so it doesn't really hit the program too hard. But Tank is furious. Uh, and, you know, he's determined to sort of blame pilot error and stuff like that rather than admit to any sort of technical fault with the aircraft. So um... he, he, he's an, an incredibly <laughs> modern sort of designer, isn't he? Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it, the, the, the excuses he comes out with, you sort of think could be in a Boeing press release. Right? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd imagine what his relationship with the regulator would be like these days. And um, I'm sure it would be very cozy. But the aircraft's given a clean bill of health and um, uh, and they, they get on with, with marketing it um, quite aggressively. So, they're, you know, they're getting into... There's this first uh, phase of, of 10 you know, A0 series aircraft, which are, are the sort of the first production model um and then there's there's the a, a b model that's 
in development and, and planned and has lots of improvements and, and has a kind of increased all up weight and more engine power and, and various developments that would have made it a more capable airliner than the than the initial one. So I think then again, quite soon we would have seen a step up in in what the aircraft could do in terms of payload and range. Now the Luftwaffe are looking at it at about the same time, is it? So we're, we're getting into the war here. Mm. How do they see the aircraft in comparison to the Donner 17, Heinkel 111, G88, think, think 87, 88, those sorts of things. How do they start looking at the Condor as an aircraft that they can make use of? Initially, it's purely as a transport aircraft. Mm -hmm. And they are prepared to, to, to order it in reasonably large numbers um, as a long-range transport because they've got loads and loads of Junkers 52s, but nothing more modern or with a longer range so i think they they think it would be helpful to have these aircraft uh in the in the transport right in the transport role so probably into they're thinking of it in terms of uh airlift is the closest it's going to get to combat yeah and just, just sort of long range long range transport into so there was, there's this idea that they're going to be fighting a war some distance away, and that, that people are going to be need to, need to be supplied at, at some range. So it's just I think this is this is where their initial interest comes from, and then obviously you get into the war, and they're in in a war with the UK, uh, and certainly the first sort of salvos of that war involve things like the the Graf Spey episode, which are kind of before the you know when we're still into the, what what people at home are calling the phony war. There's this kind of global war going on, this kind of commerce war. And the Luftwaffe has nothing whatsoever to do long-range reconnaissance. And also it doesn't really have a long-range, just just a, not a maritime reconnaissance, an actual just long-range pure reconnaissance capability as well. So initially when they're looking at the 200, one of the purposes they're looking at is this is a long-range photographic reconnaissance platform. And this never really comes off because of the need for it in maritime reconnaissance. But the first sort of properly military adaptation of it is is as a photo reconnaissance and it's it's kind of one of them is appropriated by this or a couple of them i think are appropriated by this this special unit which is um actually is sort of covert secret reconnaissance unit that's what do they call it the courier staffel which is kind of how the aircraft gets one of its names uh which is sort of this idea that it's like a kind of you know it's it's just for sort of transport and it's for communications and mail and stuff whereas actually they're you know taking these cameras off and, and photographing things like the the anchorage at scapa flow uh, and so, so this is the sort of there's a, a brief period where this is the way the, the military condor might have headed if it wasn't needed for for other purposes and then you've had this battle really between the navy and the air force ever since the the, the Luftwaffe was set up and and, and goering was involved as as to who has control over maritime operations and then the navy wants its own air arm and there's been this kind of toing and froing for years over what aircraft they'll get and how many of them they'll get and what air crews they'll get and how much control they'll have over them by um uh, operationally uh and they keep kind of making some progress and then getting knocked back um but they do have this uh, you know they are they do have a bit of freedom at this point uh, and some officers within the Luftwaffe who are who are sort of looking into the problem of of maritime reconnaissance certainly as it's fitting the war at the time with these uh, surface raiders and, and getting into u-boats a little bit in terms of um, monitoring the shipping and and the communications routes and and um, and being able to coordinate with the Navy and to act as reconnaissance for the Navy. So Edgar Peterson, uh, who has been in, um, empowered to acquire some aircraft and to, to develop this capability that, that, that the Luftwaffe is, is seriously lacking. I mean, it's got, it's got its short range flying boats. It doesn't have anything land-based long range. Um, it doesn't really have anything of the kind that's with the sort of capabilities that, that, that they really need. It's just all sort of very much coastal stuff that they've got at the time. So he goes around to look at the possibilities, and there aren't many, and he comes to the conclusion that there are two aircraft that more or less fit the bill. So there's the Junkers 
uh, U-90. It was developed as a bomber and then it was the 89 and then into an airliner. And then there was a sense of trying to turn it into a bomber again. Uh, and, and that aircraft will pop up again. Versions of it will. And there was the Focke-Wulf 200. Uh, of the two, the 200 was the only one that was currently in production and had a production line, which which was really the thing that that, that told particularly in its favour. Um, and there were a number of them available at the time. I think there probably were a couple of Junkers U90s available, but um, they would have needed to start up the production line again to get those. And Peterson needed something yesterday. He needed a, an aircraft that was just that, that would be available very, very soon, uh, with sort of minimal modifications for um, for maritime reconnaissance. So, really, stick a couple of defensive guns on it, hang a couple of bomb carriers on it to to drop the odd bomb according to its own right. But really, they need something with the range that can just get out there and use the Mark One eyeball and and look at what's going on out on the the distant ocean this process is helped somewhat by the fact that um Falk wolf appear to have done some work on developing a military version of the condor for as a very speculative effort for the japanese navy now there's various versions of this and you see lots of stuff in the published sources about how they'd already built one for the Japanese Navy and the Japanese Navy had requested it. And the first one was for the Japanese Navy and the, the Luftwaffe just took it over. And that's that's not the case. It never got very far with the Japanese Navy. Japan bought some Condors for, for very much for civil use. Kurt Tank, again, ever the salesman, was, was keen to try and break into this market in a military sense because the other German manufacturers were selling stuff to, to Japan. But the, the Japanese, they weren't really interested. And the Japanese Navy, they were kind of, they were dealing with Junkers and they were happy with Junkers and that was as far as it went. But they'd done some preliminary work um, on this, uh, on, on various adaptations. So uh, things like adding the defensive guns, uh, the Rumpfwanne, or fuselage tub, um, generally known in English as the, the gondola, which I, I avoided using the term in the book just because the, the German term for engine nacelle is gondeln, literally gondola. So I, I didn't want to confuse or annoy the people whose country this, this aircraft came from. So I thought I would use the word closer to the one that, that they would use, which is tub, because this thing looks like a bathtub stuck on the underside of the aircraft. Um, so there was a bit of design work to to, to militarise the thing, which which probably helped um, bring it uh, bring it into production and availability for, for Peterson soon. Uh, and you know, it was it was really the first one was kind of almost in a matter of weeks. And you know, uh, there were sort of so, some sort of adaptations of airliners. They they they, they took on a couple of of the airliner models to sort of get things going. But then really very soon, sort of, you know, into uh, not not that far into 1940, they, they had the, the first C model uh, military version, which was a kind of a halfway house, but it was the military adapted version. It had the, it had the tub, it had the turrets, it had sort of, you know, capability to, to, to drop bombs and, and various bits of military equipment and, and stuff like that. And the other thing it had, which probably helped with the, the development was the, modification for the long range flights had in basically involved filling the cabin just with large fuel tanks uh so these large rectangular devices that that just sat on either side of the aisle down the cabin uh and uh, and this is very much what the military condor was like the area that w in the fuselage that would have been the forward passenger cabin just had these eight fuel tanks just sitting inside the airplane and it looks <laughs> it looks really rudimentary um, it looks sort of just like an afterthought, but that's what enabled the aircraft to have this this prodigious range. You know, they didn't see, didn't feel the need to bring in anything more cohesive into the design. Just, just, just this, just these big tanks sitting on the floor uh, in the middle of the um, the cabin. Which okay, I have to say, you know, I, I, I'm not sure to what degree they were self-sealing and 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 there wasn't a great deal of you know you can't protect that amount of fuel really with huge amounts of armor so i think i'd have been a bit nervous had i been a crew on one of these things it would have been quite fumy inside i think it probably would have been extremely yeah. fumy yeah yeah because I'm, 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 I'm flicking through as i've i've not put the little post-it in the if you i mean of there's, your, there's of the, your cabin 
Uh, yeah, there, I mean, it, it, it's literally eight tanks that you sort of weave your way down. And yeah, yeah. Left, I mean, the, left to right of where the turrets and and the, the tub would be. Yeah, and I mean, I, I that's don't. About it. I don't have a. F- I don't have a photo of it in the book, but I do have the diagram, which is... Page 136, dear listener and, and viewer. There, there you go. go. Yeah. Which um, which shows the, the position of the fuel tanks um, uh, within the cabin, which um, is, um, yeah, as I say, I mean, it, it, it's... All I can say is it's as rudimentary as it looks in the diagram. They're just, they're just sat there. <laughs> um, and, and that's it. Um, but... Um, yeah, so was it six tanks in the in the cabin, and then uh, some others in the in the wing, and that's that's it. And there there was there was also the potential for for sort of auxiliary tanks within the the tub as well. If they weren't carrying bombs, they could if they were just doing pure reconnaissance, they could put more tanks in that and and just ring miles and miles out of this um, out of this aircraft. So I mean, it was a fairly minimal adaptation, but it was what they needed when they needed it. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, in our Hangar 5 uh, with more World War II aircraft. The aircraft behind us is a consolidated PB4Y2 privateer, which was a Navy patrol bomber derived from the consolidated B-24 Liberator. Um, As you notice, there's massive differences between this and the Liberator. The fuselage looks kind of the same, but it's actually an extended fuselage because there's more crew um, we need for like radar operators and, um, and other additional crew members that were on the Navy patrol aircraft. Uh, it also did not have superchargers on the engines because they didn't fly at higher altitudes like the B-24 did, which also allowed them to rotate the engines 90 degrees. You also notice it has a single tail um, versus the twin tail on the B-24. Uh, the other thing that's interesting this aircraft too is just its armament loadout is a little bit more. It has two top turrets. It has a uh, nose turret, tail turret, and two actual powered side turrets. Um, they were essentially used for patrol bombing, which would be, you know, searching for and attacking Japanese shipping and Japanese submarines, um, as well as bombing Japanese held islands. This aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew out of the Aleutian Islands for the last few months of the war, um, doing patrol missions uh, over northern Japan and bombing the Kuril Islands north of Japan that have, are a series of islands that have always kind of been contested between Russia and the Japanese. Uh, a bunch of privateers were modified after the war as fire bombers. They were given different engines and usually had their guns all taken off. and were heavily modified to fight fires. Um, they were using them up until I think about the early 2000s when they started retiring them because of like um, metal fatigue and issues that they're having with the aircraft, uh, you know, that had been flying for 50 years plus in also very bad environments. I've always thought this is a pretty unique aircraft. It's one of the only, this is the only privateer currently on display that has been modified back into its patrol bomber variant with the proper engines and all the turrets and all the radar and antennas on it. Um, so externally, this looks like it did in 1945 when it was uh, fine combat. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now... Back to the show. The book covers the entire service of the war. So you've got Norway in there, you've got Invasion of Russia, the Stalingrad airlift, and then the various, very interesting adaptations of it with the radar systems put in the nose, the drones as well, the flying Mm. bombs. We're not going to talk about that because the bit everybody knows about and probably tuned in for is operations out of Brittany with KG-40. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they're the ones who famously scared the pants off the Royal Navy in 1940, 1941. So I thought it would be more fun mm. chatting about that because by the end of this conversation, we're going to be talking cam ships and Winkle Brown. Hmm. But what we need to talk about first is the deployment of KG-40 who were desperate for long range aircraft to, to supplement what they were doing. 
they also get the fantastic marine versions of the the A8 as as well. Uh, sorry, FW190 with the extra tanks and the the pods. Different podcasts. I, I love that airplane. Anyways, <laughs> how do KG40 and Herr Peterson make use of this aircraft? Because it's scarily effective again for a very small force of aircraft. Because it's it's not that many, is it? They get deployed. No. Um, and it's and initially there are, there really aren't that many. There's a, really just a handful of aircraft that they're um, that they're operating. It does increase slightly for a lot of the the early period. They're not even into double figures of aircraft operating at any one time. And really, so they they use this is that there are sort of big patrol areas uh, there. So there's the Bay of Biscay is is a, an important one, which is is covering the Gibraltar convoys. Um, and and that section of the Atlantic convoys, and then there's the north, and there's there's a sort of northern area off Norway, so the um, the, the the waters kind of heading up to um, Iceland and, uh, and and Russia and um, that sort of area. So there's two big patrol areas that these small number of aircraft really can um, can patrol, and they can cover a vast amount of territory, and the Again, this is where you come into the sort of the politicking between the the Luftwaffe and the uh, the Kriegsmarine, where the Navy wants them to be doing reconnaissance for their U-boats and surface raiders, and the Luftwaffe commander pressuring them to to do stuff by themselves. And initially, they're carrying out these quite effective attacks on on ships, you know, on, on convoys there. If you get two or three condors, they can they can do an immense amount of damage uh, to, to merchant ships just by attacking them themselves. So either with, mostly with, with bombs, just with dumb bombs. Um, they don't have a particularly effective bomb site. You know, talking about the Norden bomb site uh, lately and everything, they don't really have a bomb site at all. So they're just coming in at masthead height and you know dr- dropping these things at, at you know aiming the aiming almost like you'd aim a gun. Just point the point the point the plane at the ship, fly as low as you can, release as late as you can, and uh, and and they're remarkably effective. Uh, they they sink a number of ships, you know, damage a, a series of ships, sort of in in the second half of 1940, uh, the early months of 1941, February 41 particularly is is just they're sinking ludicrous numbers of ships for the number of aircraft that are available to them, and this is this is what, like you say, it, it scares the Admiralty. It, it gets everyone really quite concerned and developing, running around to develop all these means of. Uh, countering them some of them are quite straightforward fitting more guns to the ships because in in the early part of the war the merchantmen are very very lightly armed uh, some of them aren't really armed at all some of them just with a couple of small machine guns or, or very very dated first world war era weapons and then when they start putting it you know even just a couple of 20 mil cannon on and things like that it changes the picture quite significantly but certainly in this early part of the war, there's not there's not really any defence against them. It's uh, you know this is sink the the Empress of Britain. I think it's in October forty, and and that's mm-hmm. you know a big big ship, um, quite heavy loss of life. Or they damage it, you know beyond saving. I think it takes the Royal Navy by surprise. It takes the RAF by surprise. Uh, it probably takes the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine by surprise a little bit as well because this just hadn't been thought of. I don't think anyone would have thought that an aircraft like the Condor could do so much damage by itself. Obviously it had this, what, sorry, go on. Yeah. Sorry. I'm probably jumping to the next point, really. Mm. That, that sort of friction between the Craig's Marine and the Luftwaffe, were they coordinating attacks or was it being used as spotter and attack while it was there? Or were they trying to draw in U-boats as well? Was, was, was there a plan or was there still competition? There was, there was a struggle Really, the whole time the aircraft was operating it, and the the tide went backwards and forwards as to who had greater operational control over the units and what they were doing. The one, the victory that the Kriegsmarine gets is is this u- unit called Fliegerführer Atlantic is set up, which which is sort of it's within the Luftwaffe, but it's responsible for operations over the Atlantic area, and the people who are involved in that are quite on board with the mission. So they're less interested in the Air Force doing its own stuff and actually more 
working more in a coordinated way. And things do keep, they pull backwards and forwards constantly, but, but you know, from from this point really in, in sort of 41, late 41, it settles down a bit more. This coincides as well really with the some of the countermeasures that come in against the Condor acting directly against shipping uh, make it somewhat less survivable. So you, you have these two factors that, that make it, that it swings more into a sort of reconnaissance and control role and uh, directing the U-boats onto the convoys rather than attacking itself. And I think there was always a sense in the Navy that it could do more damage by directing the, the Navy's assets rather than, than acting in it, or in its own. And and, uh, and to an extent, I think there's some truth in that. Um, you know, once it's made one attack, that's it. Whereas mm-hmm. it, it can loiter for a long time and, and uh, be quite useful. And it can stand off a convoy and stay out of the range of its defences. It can, it can hide in cloud rather than when it's actually attacking ships, then it's more vulnerable to the fighters and to the flak and, and all that kind of stuff. So it gets into to more of this role where it's doing this, this sort of directing and reconnaissance role uh, and communicating with the with the with the U-boats and and putting them in the right place. And that's I think probably where it where it does its greatest damage, certainly in sort of 40, late 41 going into 42, that's that's what it's doing more of. And I think there'd been a sense almost as well among the, the British that that they they feared that if there were more aircraft doing more of this kind of thing, then that would be more of a threat than than the t- attacking because they they were quite easy to defend against. Although it took a, a big effort to start with to bring in these defences to to tackle them. Once those were in place, then it never really had the same threat level by itself as an attack aircraft. Uh, and then you you had things like it was it was very limited in the way it could make attacks. So they did start fitting proper bomb sites. Uh, there was a Lofter Seven D and things like that into it, but somewhat late. So it could make high altitude attacks on on ships. But uh, again, when you've got small numbers of aircraft, it's difficult to hit something like a ship. And the Luftwaffe never really had a tradition of um, anti shipping attack the way the Italian Air Force did. Uh, and they they actually learned a lot of stuff from the Italian Air Force um, early in the war. But you know the the, the early war anti shipping um, efforts of the which again makes it quite remarkable that the that the Condor was so successful because the the early efforts with the combat aircraft against shipping were really quite unsuccessful or, or rather they needed a huge effort to get a relatively small result. And they learnt more throughout the war. Uh, and I think, again, there was a sense that had they paid more attention to it, they'd have been able to do a lot more damage. So things like the development of the torpedo, it lagged a long way behind, and, and they kind of got that up to a fairly reasonable level by the time it was too late. That's a good point, because the German Luftwaffe never had an effective aerial torpedo until, well, there, there was no nothing to drop an aerial torpedo from was there there was mm, no there with no car- with, with no carrier borne aircraft with, with no tradition he says doing air, air quotes they just put all the focus into traditional su- sub- submarine based fish yeah i mean and again there was there was a small effort to to develop an aerial torpedo and and again with this sort of on again off again thing with the german carrier mm. Um, they did develop the aircraft for it, including a torpedo bomber, but um, the, the effort that went into the torpedo was was really lacking and, and it was a very small development. It was like two guys in a shed trying to, to figure out the aerial torpedo and it, they started, they picked it up um, in 41 and, and put a proper development effort into it, but it was, you know, they, it was late in the day by then and they were using Italian torpedoes. They bought Italian torpedoes for a while and then the, the, the supply of them dried up. So, uh, you know, there's a document that, um, uh, a sort of rather self-justifying document that a Luftwaffe officer wrote, which kind of blamed the Navy for not putting m- more effort into it um, uh, and saying sort of all the, the, how the aerial torpedo they had was no barely any better than a first world war one and things like that which i don't think it was as that bad but uh you know it, it was 
Um, it was it was slow and unreliable. It probably wasn't as bad as the American torpedo was in 1942, to be honest. Uh, but you know, it, so again, that was there was these, the inter-service politics played into that, and it was they they could have had a decent torpedo earlier on had the services been working properly or directed properly, and and there was less politics in the upper echelons of it rather than deciding how to fight and win a war. But yeah, and they 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 did manage to they they hung. Uh, sort of up to three torpedoes could be hung on, off a condor and uh, it wasn't the best launch platform but it was the kind of thing where you've got if you've got three and you're launching them at a ship um, you've got a decent spread so you've got a half decent chance of, of hitting something by the time they got it sorted the, the condor wasn't really doing very much in the direct shipping attack role at all and there, there were one or two attacks but they didn't lead to any uh, any results and, and and by that time they were sort of moving on from the condor and the condor was moving on from that kind of thing anyway let's start heading towards the end because one of the things that's always come up with condor is this this fragility of it you, mm, know, you, mm. you, you talked about it snapping in half on landing <laughs> and things it was a beast to actually take out of the sky as dear eric found out as one very nearly killed him mm. it was a lot tougher than sort of the arm, armchair historians put on, isn't it? Because it, it's, from an air-to-air -air perspective, it's in, it's covered in machine guns. Mm. It's it's designed for long, long-ish range, sturdy flight operations out of probably not the best airfields anyways. Mm. And one thing Kurt Tank did was make strong aircraft. So this this idea of fragility, where does it come from? And this, because you know, I've just been Googling while you've been chatting, there are pictures of them <laughs> snapped in yeah, half on yeah. airfields, but which you would expect from something that's had a hard landing. But where's this idea come from that it was fragile? Well, probably a number of sources, to be honest. I think it's pushed by people who want to dismiss the aircraft. And I, I, I see this as along the same lines as the whole Typhoon's tail snap off thing. People say that as a as a thank, way thank of thank you for that. Well, you know, it's <laughs> I you know I think in, in in narrative terms it's it's very similar. Um, and you tend to, you know, with 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 due respect to people that I've discussed this with, the the sense I get from people who bring up the the fuselage snapping in half uh, tend to be they have a low opinion of the aircraft, and that's like a sort of that encapsulates their view of the aircraft. It's like something with which they can just set it to one side and 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 disregard its its mm -hmm. value as a as a war fighting machine. And I think this is very similar to, to to the way the Typhoon Tales thing goes. It's it's like you don't have to look any further. Oh well, if if it snapped in half on landing, it can't be any good. And part of it was it didn't have the same level of structural strength as an aircraft that was designed as a combat aircraft and you even get this from pow interrogations where they're saying you know it's it's designed for like it's got a sort of strength factor of two and uh, you know the typical bombers have a safety factor of eight because it was designed as an airliner uh, and and it's not designed to be thrown around to, to be you know dropping bombs to be avoiding uh T taking avoiding action against fighters and stuff like that and and you know making steep dives and steep climbs and steep turns and all that kind of stuff it's just not designed for that um so you know that that's i think that's part of where it comes from part of it is from the german air crews who were actually very conscious of this the, the structural strength of the aircraft and the limits of the aircraft in terms of what you could put it through uh, and they did have to manoeuvre it quite gingerly. And there was an example of an early one, I think, during the Norwegian campaign, where a, one of the more experienced pilots was actually larking about, chucking this, um, ch chucking the aircraft about over, I think it was Tempelhof, and it just broke apart in midair. It just, you know, it, it just fell to pieces because it wasn't designed for that kind of treatment. You know, it was designed for civil aerodromes, which, uh, you know, have decent grass... At the time, mainly grass, you know, tarmac was coming in. But, you know, you expect a decently smooth surface on a, on a civil air, a, a nice big aerodrome where you can put it down gently, not a sort of a smaller military thing that might be chewed up or, you know, have bomb holes filled up in it or whatever. So it was being used in circumstances that it wasn't entirely designed for. But 
I think there was a, there was a period early on in its use where the first, the C1 model was a very very limited modification of the uh, of the B model. Uh, which would have been an airliner and turned into a transport aircraft. It really just had the military stuff stuck on it, and that was that. Uh, the C-3 and thereafter had um, more fuselage strengthening. They had more airframe, a bit more um, strengthening. And I think probably there was also the crews learned, learned a bit more about how they could treat it um, and how to, to use it. Because I think there was that inexperience early on as well. And there was a, there was a case of a couple of them heavy landing snap in half. And I don't even know if those were those might have been cases where the aircraft was damaged and making a, um, a landing under difficult circumstances or, uh, or, or or something like that, or you know whether it ran into a shell hole. It's it, and if you look through the losses, the and, and in one of because um, you know we should we should mention Chris Goss who is who is the master mm. the the, the Fogwolf two hundred master. I'm just kind of dipping my toe in in the aircraft, but you know he's he's written a lot on the aircraft. And one of his books, which is uh, The Condor at War, 1939-1945, which is Beautiful from Classic. Book, yeah. um, very good book. Different kind of book to mine. You know, my book has has selling points as well, but we'll get into that. It has a list of, of combat losses. And a lot of the early ones are landing and takeoff damage. And that gets a bit thinner as the, the service goes on. So I th- my sense of it is early on you had the weaker aircraft and the inexperience in operating it uh, and, and possibly they weren't you know they were operating in in the Norwegian campaign where it was you know they were very much on the front line whereas later on they were more in their established bases so they were possibly in rougher places as well but I mean but my point my point about the snapping in half is this uh, I mean it's it's a, for one thing it's it's I think it's overdone the other thing is the aircraft doesn't get to do what it does if you build it like a combat aircraft, it doesn't have that phenomenal range. It doesn't have the the loitering ability, the the efficiency, and everything like that. It gets all those things because it was designed as a long range airliner. It's able to cover these huge patrol areas out in the in the northern waters and the, uh, the over the North Sea and the Iceland Faroes Gap and and then down to the Bay of Biscay and things like that. It's able to cover those vast areas because of its inherent characteristics. And if you build it like a combat aircraft, it doesn't get to do those things. Later on, maybe when you've got more advanced techniques and lighter materials and uh you know more efficient engines and stuff like that maybe you can do that a bit more but with this aircraft you've got a choice and i think the the, the trade-off is they break a bit more often than a, a combat aircraft would i mean it is a weakness but it was that was the trade-off to enable them to do what they did whereas people treat it as a, a reason it was no good whereas no sorry that's the reason it was good and yeah, like you say, in terms of it, actually could take a lot of punishment from um, from aircraft, from flak, and things like that. You know, they come back with damage. Uh, in terms of its its structure, it, it it wouldn't stop very much, but it'll keep flying with with quite a lot of damage. Uh, and given the fact that you can't really manoeuvre it very vigorously, it, it does it gets away with a lot. Considering you know, few fewer than three hundred of these things built, and the combat losses weren't crippling they you know they were moderately heavy given what they were doing but they weren't you know they, they, it wasn't so bad that they had to to pull the thing out of the sky it, it's that similar situation we've talked with with adam with the, the c-47 mm. you know it's 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 a transport aircraft it's it's not a fighter bomber it's not mm-hmm. a you know it, it's it it has its operational window and it won't get out of that because that's how it's designed to stay in it and keep keep the people in the back their drinks and their drinks and sorry their their, their drinks in the glasses and uh, mm. the aircraft in the air so it's a different thing let's get to your takeaways for this because there's only one left and it's a composite one that airbus have put back together in yeah. in, in in is it in bremen these days? it's um it's at templehof i think um, is it at templehof? Berlin. i think it's at templehof I, now yeah i think i think they a, put it together at bremen yeah we we need a a sort of group chat away trip to oh yeah to to, to Berlin and totally uh, to, do all that sort of stuff, but it's still an incredibly aesthetically pleasing aircraft. They've done an, an absolutely beautiful job um, with the recreation, mm. which is a couple a couple cu- bits of a couple different ones and lots of new build. Yeah, but what's having written the book? What's your takeaway from it? Because it's it's one of those aircraft that 
does have this savage reputation. Mm. And you, you do wonder, as I keep saying, trying to get this podcast away from military aircraft, you wonder hmm. what this and its subsequent developments as an airliner could have done. Because it is it is very much on that leading cusp of where Douglas would eventually get with to with the, the, the DC-6 and, and things like that, um, Lockheed with the Constellation. You you can see that line yeah. getting to it. And I think you've got the tangents of the, the de Havilland Al Albatross, which was just too damn small. But mm -hmm. it's it's kind of right, isn't it? And it ends up doing something it was probably never intended for. But as a as an aircraft, it's another one of these ones that Kurt Tank got it. Yeah, I mean, he he got it spot on, really, considering what he was working with and where it was coming from. There was nothing like this in the the, the Focke-Wulf stable before that. I mean, where it... You just look at the, the previous... And to be honest, there are one or two sort of military designs where you see some of the design cues and the sort of some of the shapes and things like that starting to emerge. Um, but this was really just... To hit that result straight away, first time designing a large modern airliner, is just astonishing. And then I think the thing that's... Because, you know, you know the story and you know the story from a certain perspective um, when you're a British naval aviation writer. But it, did, it astonished me just how much damage it did with so few aircraft over a relatively short period of time, but still a long enough period of time to, to really cause some worry. And it really did spark the the response in in the allies that that was you know it was a major and long-term response of developing the the escort carrier which would then turn into this huge asset during the battle of the atlantic in the up in, in the anti-submarine role and then as a combat carrier for use in amphibious landings and all that kind of stuff and it's just but this came out of a response really to one aircraft where they had a few dozen of them. Obviously things like the cam ship, which is like the closest that I think for, for British services to be operating something like a suicide weapon, which obviously it wasn't, you know, a lot of them were recovered and so on, but the way it's the fact that it's a one shot weapon and people did die just from operating the aircraft, you know, they bailed out and they um, didn't get picked up. They didn't get picked up, but the response that it triggered just goes to show the 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 seriousness of it, and and I think that that I was astonished, even even knowing substantial parts of the story, just how much of an effect it had. Um, and then, you know, which we didn't really get to in the, but but other parts of the book where it, it's its role in certain airlift operations and things like that was actually really major, given the tiny number of airframes that were involved in it, and it was like. It's this aircraft that wherever it goes, it seems to have this sort of outsize effect from, from a few aircraft is sort of able to really just just multiply. It's a force multiplier, as they say, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a modern term. But yeah, it's it's just something that you can do an awful lot with a few of them. Uh, and that, that really surprised me in, in, in doing this book. We're going to have to do an episode on, on the cam ships. And mm. um, was it Tim Elkington was was a hurry cat pilot i think he was we'll have that's another show but we, we'll have to we'll have to do this all from yep. from the, the other side but thank you i like i said i've i've i need to give your your book more time i've, I've dove delve into the bits that i've that i've chatted to chris about as well because his bloody biscay book is is superb on this sort of thing even though i tend to read that for the fw 190s it's um <laughs> another tank aircraft that we haven't discussed directly matt this has been great what are you working on at the moment because i have a couple of lovely copies of your carrier aircraft bookazines and i know there's a follow-up to that so what is that that's carrier aircraft of the propeller area which is out from airplane which is really good fun discussing all the the, the proppy type yeah carrier born aircraft well and you've I've, just finished the follow-up just finished the follow-up which is is carrier aircraft of the classic jet era so Shocker. that's really going from <laughs> the, the the first from the first jet landing to uh, to really to really the end of the Cold War. So sort of early nineties. So all that classic, you know, Korea, Vietnam, a lot of the Cold War stuff, um, and uh, yeah, again, re yeah, massive fun pulling it together. I think you know, really quite sort of proud with with what I've achieved with it. 
uh, t- touch wood and just yeah really looking forward to seeing that one i hope people enjoy it because um you know there's, there's it packs a lot in there's the key key book of zines are, i like them generally they pack a lot in but there's you know this is proper proper work and plug this one again what have we been talking about we have been talking about fog wolf 200 condor eagles of the luftwaffe book two from morton's in their tempest imprint yeah and it's it's out now um i think 16.99 Links in the description below, dear listener. Thank you. Here. Yes, they're, they're all, we, we make sure we, we plug it off very much. Matt, it is always a pleasure. I promise one of these times I'm going to give you more notice than about 48 hours of saying, <laughs> can you pop on the pod? No, I'm, I'm delighted, to, delighted to, to contribute. Well, thank you for that. Give Nikolai a cuddle from us. Yeah. I've got my, my, my other half's outside. She arrived on her scooter. She needs my help to get the bike back in. She's been beeping at me for the last five minutes. <laughs> right. Thank you, mate. <laughs> See you. As always, I cannot thank Matt Willis enough for answering my panicked calls and jumping on a podcast when I realised that, yeah, I forgot to plan one in for this week. Going forward, we're going to be at the Pima Air and Space Museum next week, so there's not going to be a formal episode, but we're going to be posting a lot of stuff onto our Discord, which is slowly starting to get people on it. I'd like it to be a thing. It's easier than using the Twitters and things like that for sharing direct aviation things. So we're going to be posting lots of little videos and things from the museum on the Discord. They'll be elsewhere as well. But if you want to join us, the link is in the description below. There's like-minded people. Some chat at the moment about Masters of the Air, which we will not be covering too much on the show going forward. Maybe delve into it. But join us on that. Of course, if you want these episodes without the ads, without me plugging too much, there's still a bit of me plugging stuff, join us on the Patreon. £3 a month plus a bit of that at the bottom tier. You get everything at all the tiers. You just get to join us, have some fun. We've had our first Zoom social, which was a giggle. We had Scott Marchand from the Pima Air and Space Museum. Next one's going to be April, May time. So there's plenty of time to join up and join the fun. Become a damn castier and help support the show. Of course, as always, tell your friends, like and subscribe, do all those good things, because actually the algorithms work great when you just hit that like or put some stars into your podcast app of choice. The reviews have been lovely. We're going to keep this thing going for, well, as long as my wife lets me, and we'll see how long that is. I am taking her to Arizona, so that's always a good thing. Until next time, everybody. Do take care of yourselves. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.